My name is Margot Landman, and I am Deputy Vice President for Programs at the National Committee on US-China Relations. I am delighted to introduce our speaker for today's interview. Louisa Lim is an award-winning journalist who spent a decade in China reporting for the BBC and NPR. She is most recently the author of Indelible City, Dispossession and Defiance in Hong Kong. Her earlier book, The People's Republic of Amnesia, Tiananmen Revisited, is also a terrific read. Dr. Lim is a senior lecturer in audiovisual journalism at the University of Melbourne, and she joins us from Australia. Let's start at the beginning. When did you decide to write the book and how did you make the shift from the so-called impartial observer traditionally expected of journalists to participant observer more typical of say an anthropologist? <laughs> Oh, well, that's a really hard question to start with, Margot. <laughs> um, I started working on this book in 2014. Of course, I didn't know it was going to be a book at that point. I thought maybe it would be an article or something. Um, and just over time, the book, the idea grew and grew. You know, at the beginning, I thought I was just going to write a small, maybe an article about the King of Kowloon, who was this iconic figure who really fascinated me. But in trying to find out more about him, I just sort of kept going down alleyways that turn out not to be alleyways, but really sort of important uh, things that I wanted to explore more. And so, you know, eventually it turned into a book. Uh, the moment when I shifted, I guess it was a slow shift. It, um, there was always um, an element of myself in the book because I was always writing about my family's history with Hong Kong and those were the parts that my editor really loved the most um, and she kept encouraging to meet me to write more and more about myself but then there was one moment and it's the moment that I start the book with where I was uh, on a rooftop watching these sign painters sort of secret sign painters who did massive signs that are um, several stories high and I was watching them paint and I just decided that I wanted to paint with them. You write a lot in the book about the history of Hong Kong. That is history is described by the British, history is described by the Chinese. You quote an archeologist who says Fundamentally, the past is a political topic, and you've got to be careful how you package it and how you present it. So whose history are you packaging and presenting, and do you see it as a fundamentally political act? I mean, what I wanted to explore was all the different histories of Hong Kong and how they could sit and coexist, sometimes in the same space when they're so, you know, particularly the British and the Chinese version were particularly so completely different from each other, sometimes sort of not even hardly intersecting at all. So I wanted to explore, you know, the very idea of history, whose history is it, who's doing the telling, and who's included in this history. Um, very early on, I spoke to a Hong Kong historian called Tim Ko, and when I asked him about the colonial histories, he said this sentence, which really sort of stuck with me the whole way. He said there were no Chinese names, no Chinese faces, and almost no history before the British. And so in a way, that was one of my guiding principles that I wanted to write a history. And I don't think there is a definitive history. I don't think there can be because history is a political act. But I wanted to write a history that centered Hong Kong people and Hong Kong voices. Um, and, you know, explored Hong Kong as an entity, you know, uh, before, before the British as you know, British history really presents Hong Kong as, you know, in the words of Lord Palmerston, the foreign secretary, a barren rock with nary a house on it, you know, a kind of blank slate before the British arrival. And, um, you know, that simply wasn't true. So I kind of wanted to restore that as well. 
following up on that, because the Hong Kong folks were not only not present in the history, they weren't present in some of the present, as it were. Much of the book is devoted to a description of the talks in the 1980s that led to the joint declaration and later to the basic law, making the point that the negotiations were between the British and the Chinese in Beijing. Hong Kongers did not have a seat at the table. In retrospect, that seems like an enormous injustice, but given the realities of colonial rule, could it have been any different? I mean, of course, things could have been different. Things could always have been different. You know, there are counterfactuals to every situation and things could have been different at various points as well. And I do think it's one of the um, defining features of these histories that are imposed on us that uh, the final outcome is sort of seen as an inevitability when it wasn't necessarily the, you know, inevitable. Uh, I, I mean, you know, the so I was using an archive of interviews um, from 1980s and 1990s that was collected by Steve Zhang, who's now at SOAS, and he interviewed um, colonial governors and senior civil servants. And most interestingly for me, this group of people called the unofficials, who were the unofficial um, members of the Executive and Legislative Council of Hong Kong appointed by the British governors. So they were the sort of de facto um, cabinet, the, probably the most senior local politicians in an age really before party politics. And their reminiscences, their, these oral histories that they gave to Steve Zhang were just so, to me, they were really stunning. They were really, um, they just cast a completely different light on how that agreement was reached and how the Hong Kongers had been left out and how even those who were supposed to advise the British government, you know, their voices were minimized, they were ignored at certain points, they were shut out from having the information that they needed to advise um, the British. And, you know, the question is, could it have been different? And, you know, I guess another answer is to say that I, you know, it was a big question for me as well, what would have been different had the Hong Kong voices really been heeded? Because there were warnings that they gave along the way and these warnings um, were warnings that today seem very prescient because the situation we're in today is exactly what they warned about. And, uh, you know, I did go with that question and I asked Chris Patton, who was the last governor of Hong Kong, how much difference would it have made if the British had paid attention to what the unofficials are saying, if they'd listened to their own advisors. And he said that he did think uh, it could have made a difference. Um, how much difference, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the unofficials, and just as an aside, that's such an odd designation for people, were they <laughs> a force for democratic rule in Hong Kong? No, they weren't. And, you know, that really gave the British cover not to introduce democracy. Um, you know, the most senior unofficial, a man called S.Y. Chung, C.U.N. Chung, um, who was the senior unofficial for, for many years um, and sort of a, quite an influential figure in Hong Kong, he actually believed that, um, you know, democracy would make Hong Kong ungovernable, that Hong Kong was like a corporation and that rich people should have more votes than poor people. And, uh, um, you know, and I think those kind of views were not uh, unusual amongst the unofficials. So I think, you know, the British did listen to them at moments when it suited them. And certainly when it came to questions of democracy, I think the unofficial, the views of the unofficials were very helpful to the British because it, you know, it could give them cover not to make any democratic reforms. Uh, and that's what they did, you know. At that time, the era of Murray McLehose, who was the longest running governor of Hong Kong, he, um, you know, there were really interesting interviews in the archive where he talked about how um, in place 
of democracy, he was introducing participation, like an uh, anti-littering campaign, which, you know, actually was very memorable. It was one of the first big civic campaigns. You know, anyone who grew up in the Hong Kong in the 70s or 80s would remember there was a big dragon called Lap Sap Chong, which means rubbish. And they did all these adverts with this green and red spotted dragon. And, you know, it was a huge feature of my childhood. I remember it at the time. What I didn't realize was this was literally almost being offered as an alternative to democracy. And that's how the governor of the time, Murray McElhose, framed it in the interviews. Um, and, you know, with support from the, exec the, the, the unofficials, because, of course, just a little participation, but not that much from, from you know, the local population did make Hong Kong easier to govern. I'd like to push a little further on that, on the notion of democracy and who should have it and who shouldn't. Reminds me of conversations that I've had with people on the mainland that um, democracy is would not be good for people in the PRC because the unwashed masses are not ready for it. But let's get back to Hong Kong. The British presumably saw their country as a democracy, but seemed to have a major blind spot when it came to promoting democracy in Hong Kong. If you agree with that characterization, could you talk about why that might have been the case? Well, I mean, I think the British were always, um, you know, one thing that I think drove the British was, you know, memories of history, the way in which Hong Kong had become British. That was something that was deeply shameful and the British knew it, you know, that the Opium Wars uh, had not been a moment of sort of shining triumph and moral rectitude for the British. And they knew that if Hong Kongers should really understand how Hong Kong would become British, then they may not have much sympathy for their colonial rulers. And then I think, you know, particularly if you think about the situation in the late 60s, there were leftist riots in Hong Kong in the late 60s. Uh, there was, uh, there were, you know, there was some degree of sympathy in certain sections of the population, it was a very divided population, but there was some sympathy for, for Chairman Mao and communism. And um, I think, you know, the British were always anxious. They knew there were, you know, underground communist movements in Hong Kong. There were also, you know, very strong uh, pro Guomindang stronghold um, you know, and that, you know, the, the riots of in the late 1960s were very violent. You know, there were the bombing campaigns, you know, about 50 people were killed. So I think there was a fear at the back of the British, you know, calculation that if democracy were to be introduced, maybe it wouldn't go the way that they wanted. I mean, you know, that's not to say that there were, you know, not many other opportunities after the 60s and the 70s, 80s and 90s uh, to introduce democracy, which they also didn't, um, you know, uh, take advantage of. So, uh, you know, it was very much foot dragging um, on the part of the British. And I think it was also that um, calculation that Hong Kong um, should be easier to govern. And also, you know, looking over the border, looking at China, and the fear that if they went too far, China might just invade at that point and take Hong Kong back at that point. You know, that was also a calculation um, back in 1982, when Thatcher met Deng Xiaoping for the first time, he did say to her, you know, we could take Hong Kong tomorrow if we wanted. And I think that those words um, and that calculation also sort of underlay every British assumption and decision about how to rule Hong Kong. So let's fast forward to July 1st, 1997, 
when Prince Charles represented the British at the handover ceremony, he said in an, speaking of indelible image in the pouring rain, we shall not forget you and we shall watch with the closest interest as you embark on this new era of your remarkable history. As you wrote, there were no guarantees, no monitoring, no oversight. It seems to rely on trust. When we look back now, such confidence clearly seems misplaced. But could you describe the sentiment at the time? Were people in Hong Kong actually confident that Beijing would adhere faithfully to one country, two systems? I mean, people had no choice. It didn't matter whether they were confident or not. That is the state of being a colonial subject. Um, you know, you have no say over your own future. And so, you know, I think at that specific moment, there was this sort of mixture of hope and fear and anxiety. And, you know, people did still really buy the idea that economic change would inexorably lead to political change. So they hoped that Hong Kong could be a model for China, that China would change to be more like Hong Kong. Um, but, you know, coming back to the role played by the unofficials, that was what was so interesting to me when the joint declaration was negotiated um, in the 1980s, if you go back and read, there's a lot of um, cables, diplomatic memos and cables that have been released in the years since. And they really clearly show how the unofficials were really anxious. They really pushed for safeguards, for monitoring mechanisms, international monitors. And the British just shrugged them off, you know. There were, there were these sort of extraordinary conversations in 10 Downing Street where the unofficials said, um, you know, well, what happens if if the, the the joint declaration is violated? And the British said, well, you know, we just think that <laughs> China would not want to lose face by breaking an international agreement. Um, you know, and the Foreign Office advisors were saying, well, it, it's never really broken an agreement in the past. And the uh, Hong Kong advisors were saying, well, what, hold on a minute, what about Tibet? What about the 17-point agreement in Tibet? There was sort of really clearly violated and the British just shrugged it off um, so you know that is the state of being a colonial subject that <laughs> your fate is not in your own hands and I guess the people who could leave did We've well the people not... the people who could leave off left before the handover but it was more like an insurance policy people went overseas they got passports then they came back because they um that was their insurance if things might go wrong. And there was a huge exodus in, in the, you know, in the 90s, the mid 90s, and particularly, uh, you know, given the fact that this was only a few years after the killings um, in 1989, you know, and now we're seeing the second big exodus. But the difference is that people aren't, it's not an insurance policy anymore. People are leaving never to return. Right. Looking back, there seems to be a fairly clear through line from the Article 23 protests in 2003 to the patriotic education protests in 2012, to the umbrella movement two years later, to the enormous protests in 2019. Do you see something that ties them together? And if so, what is it? I mean, it, it's identity. And, you know, I think that not just those protests, but there were other protests as well that were smaller but equally important. So in 2006, there were um, protests when uh, they um, demolished Queen's Pier, and then there were protests about the high speed rail line, there was protests about uh, Wedding Card Street being knocked down. So, so there were these sort of preservationist cultural heritage protests at the same time. And I think a lot of these really revolved around identity, around Hong Kongers trying to protect um, 
their values, these Hong Kong values, which are, you know, liberal democratic values, like, you know, democracy, uh, rule of law, but also um, trying to protect their own landmarks, whether they be colonial landmarks or sort of more vernacular <laughs> sites like Wedding Card Street. Um, you know, I think Hong Kongers have shown that they, um, you know, there's been this sort of extraordinary myth that Hong Kongers are not interested in politics. That's never been true, but it's been something that Hong Kong's colonial rulers, both the British and the Chinese, have repeated over and over again, maybe hoping that they could make it true. Uh, but, uh, you know, recent history and ancient history uh, shows that it, it's simply, you know, it's a myth. What is Wedding Card Street or what was it? <laughs> Wedding Card Street was a street in Wan Chai where there were a whole line of really small printing shops that made cards for, you know, your wedding invitation cards. And that was where you traditionally went to get them printed. And it was knocked down and they kind of rehoused all the printers in a sort of really glossy, shiny, upscale sho indoor shopping mall. So, you know, these are small changes, but they're also changes to the kind of fabric of, of life, the cultural heritage in many ways of Hong Kong. And this was also, you know, that one in particular was one of those early changes that uh, garnered quite a lot of opposition. Interesting. You mentioned at the outset when we started talking, the King of Kowloon. Could you talk more about him who was he and why is he such a significant figure to you? So the King of Kowloon was this extraordinary figure, you know, very iconic figure. Uh, when I was growing up, he was everywhere. He was this, his real name was Zhang Zhou Choi. And he was this, when I was growing up, this sort of elderly man who looked a bit like a hobo, you know, who you often saw him in the streets shirtless, uh, you know, just wearing shorts and sandals. And um, he believed that Kowloon, the peninsula of Kowloon, originally belonged to his clan and had been stolen from them when it was given to the British in the 1860s. And he spent um, half a century writing his claims to his dominion on the walls of Hong Kong, and not just the walls, it was on the post boxes and the electricity boxes and the lamp posts and the flyovers, but he was very contextual. He only ever targeted crown land or land owned by the government. And, you know, his calligraphy was really quite terrible, you know, um, like he only had two years of education. So his writing was kind of ugly, <laughs> you know, a bit of an eyesore, very blocky and square and not in harmony, you know, all the characters mushed up together, sort of really close and big and small ones together. But he became, you know, a celebrity. In 1997, he had an art exhibition and then uh, he had a few others. He was uh, Hans Ulrich Obrist, who's a very famous curator, took him to the Venice Biennale. I took his work there. Um, in 2003, so he became the first Hong Konger to represent Hong Kong at the Venice Biennale. You know, his work was selling in Sotheby's for a quarter of a million US dollars, so he became Hong Kong's most, um, most valuable artist at a certain point, and he was, you know, he played cameos in local films, he did adverts for, like, cleaning fluid and Louis Vuitton handbags. He was sort of celebrated in song and in poetry and in art. And I was just fascinated with him because for me, um, he was sort of this emblematic figure who was talking about these issues of territory and sovereignty and dispossession decades before anyone else. You know, so long before other people that everybody thought he was crazy. And, you know, he may, you know, he may have been uh, not very competent mentally, and yet, as one of my interviews, interviewees said to me, you know, maybe only when you go crazy can you see the truth, uh, you know. So now when you ask people about him, you know, they, 
the, they, they sort of speak about him almost, you know, in a different way. Maybe he wasn't crazy. Maybe he was a prophet. You know, everything that he wrote about has since come true. So I just thought he's such a symbolically interesting figure. Did you ever meet him? I never met him. But, you know, his work was everywhere when I was growing up. And I, I don't know, I just kind of almost felt he was so familiar a character to me. I almost felt like I... <laughs> had seen him. <laughs> you may if you ask people, Sorry. you know, it is interesting if you ask people, they can never remember where they first saw his work because it was just so present. You know, it was like, you know, the air or uh, trees or whatever. It was just always everywhere. And it, you know, would often get washed away and then he'd come back and write on the same places. So it was kind of, more living than a normal kind of, um, you know, artwork in a gallery would be. It was kind of a more present uh, kind of uh, activity. And you mentioned that even after he died, when you thought, and I assume most people thought that his artwork or however it should be described, had all been cleared away, it was actually still there. That's right. And, you know, interestingly, there's one piece which has just appeared just a couple of weeks ago under a railway bridge in Mong Kok. And um, that, this new one is quite big. And, you know, when it first appeared, it was really obviously... Um, unveiled because there were all these flakes of paint on the ground and people were going almost like on a pilgrimage you know you there were all these people flocking there to take pictures of it so there's an extraordinary collector called Joel Chung who was one of the people who kind of helped the king in later life and was a great friend to him and I discovered as I was reporting and writing my book that Joel has has been running this um, extraordinary campaign for years where he has been, um, because he was with the king of Kowloon when, when he went and painted these sites. So he knew where they were. And one by one, he's been going to places where he knew that the king had painted and where the picture had been covered over and chipping away the top covering to reveal the writing underneath and in some cases, he's covering it up again. So he's painting it with clear varnish to protect it and then covering it up again. But in the case of the most recent one, I think it's still out in the open. And now there's a discussion about whether it should be preserved or not, you know, uh, which is another controversy because the government has never liked the King of Kowloon's work. It's seen it as vandalism and unsightly. And, you know, they won't call it even when it comes to the calligraphy in the newspapers, it's often called uh, mock ball or ink treasures. But the government, they won't even call it calligraphy. They will call it ink writing, but they do not want to even use vocabulary that um, has an artistic connotation because they, um, for many years, they've kind of uh, had this policy of not really seeing it as art. So interesting. You may... Make- just, if I could just sure. quickly say, I actually have a six-part podcast on the King of Kowloon, uh, which um, is coming out on the ABC. So do listen for that because that's got more detail on him. Absolutely. You make an interesting comment early in the book as you looked across Deep Bay in 2019 at Shukul. Before 1979, the beginning of China's reform and opening, Shenzhen was a proverbial sleepy fishing village while Hong Kongers saw themselves as more modern, more technologically advanced and richer than those on the mainland. Maybe that has shifted, leaving Hong Kong as the less modern, less advanced and less wealthy area. What do you think? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think Hong Kongers have, you know, for a long time, Hong Kongers viewed 
you know, there has been a divide between Hong Kongers and mainlanders, and that's a divide which you can track quite clearly in the public opinion surveys in Hong Kong in, um, on their views of mainlanders. And uh, I think 1997 was the time where Hong Kongers felt most proud to be Chinese and where people would identify themselves as both Hong Kongers <clears throat> and Chinese. And now that has diverged. Um, and I, the most recent results that came out the other day, I think they said only 2% of young people in their early 20s in Hong Kong would identify themselves as Chinese, whilst the, you know, the vast majority would identify themselves only as Hong Kongers. So that identity, which used to overlap, has really bifurcated. Um, and I think part of the, you know, some of the roots of that, um, in the 20, around 2012, there was a big, a lot of anti-mainland sentiment in Hong Kong uh, because of people doing parallel trading, coming in and buying up milk powder, um, this kind of thing. But, you know, in the, and that, you know, continued to build. And in the years since then, you know, I think Hong Kongers have been taken aback to see very, very wealthy mainlanders coming over and, you know, changing in some cases the Hong Kong economy. You know, there's also been 150 mainland migrants a day. So there's a question of resources, of how much of Hong Kong's resources are going towards mainland migrants. Um, you know, I guess now the alarming thing for Hong Kongers is in some ways the mainland is more technologically advanced, and that certainly is when it comes to surveillance technology. And I think the real fear in Hong Kong now is how quickly is that being rolled out in Hong Kong, and how long, you know, a Hong Kong. You know, I know that already there's a lot of fear about using the internet and what you can, you know whether internet usage is, is surveilled or not in Hong Kong, you know, sites are being um, taken offline and made un unavailable. So we're be seeing the beginnings of censorship, but you know, whether these really advanced tracking mechanisms and social credit systems, whether they're going to be rolled out in Hong Kong, I think is, uh, you know, something that really alarms Hong Kongers, along with the idea that the internet uh, might be uh, surveilled and used as an instrument of um, control. And I guess already we're seeing national security legislation using comments made online. So there's already an element of that. But, you know, I, I think people fear what will happen next. You just mentioned the national security law, which went into effect almost exactly two years ago, June 30th, 2020. There wasn't even a pretense of consultation. In your words, the national security law undermined the high degree of autonomy, sidelined the judiciary and canceled the rule of law. What do you see happening to or in Hong Kong going forward? I mean, the new chief executive, John Lee, was the secretary of security who was in charge of suppressing the protests. He has a background in the police force. So I think that's a really um, clear signal for what the mainland's priorities will be going forward. I think Hong Kong, you know, national security is front and center of every decision in Hong Kong. I think that for Xi Jinping, Hong Kong is probably seen as a security risk more than anything else. And I think that will govern all decisions that are made. I think going forward, we're likely to see a lot more tightening, you know, may, maybe um, there's, there's talk about laws to stop um, rumors, you know, uh, that, that kind of, um, you know, law, uh, you know, which these kind, this kind of legislation, which 
um, its effect will be to further narrow the space for free expression in Hong Kong. You know, I suspect that what we're going to see going forward is, you know, more of the same, but even faster. So more national security education, more rewriting of the curriculum, more controls being placed, uh, you know, COVID zero continuing, um, and more moves which really undermine Hong Kong as being having any sort of autonomy separate from China in, in policy terms. We've run out of time. I have one last question. Do you think you'll ever be able to return to Hong Kong and under what circumstances? I mean, when I, like my last book, when I wrote this book, I decided to write what I wanted to write regardless of whether it would make it hard for me to return or not. Um, you know, I don't have any plans to go back in, in the near future. Um, you know, one day, maybe, but I, I don't know when that day will be. Louisa, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your insights. I can't recommend this book highly enough. It's really terrific and thought provoking and very sad. I'd like to thank also the National Committee staff behind the scenes who have made today's interview possible. And we hope that those of you who've tuned in found the interview interesting and informative and that you will join us for future National Committee programming. Thanks again and goodbye.